beautiful, sunny, green days in Vermont inside uh, speaks to your commitment and dedication to the issue that we're going to tackle today. Um, so I, I, let, me, let me just share uh, some, some logistics and some thanks and uh, just a mix of things so we can jump quickly into the program. I just want to note at the outside, uh, the, the main group of people I want to thank is you. Uh, as I look around this room, what an incredible gathering. Just an unbelievable mix of, of perspectives, background, experiences. Um, there's centuries of experience and knowledge in environmental land use, um, housing, transportation, um, government, development, uh, advocacy. Just what an incredible gathering of folks. Uh, I think one of our, our grandest hopes, where's Kate? Kate's probably out there chatting still. So, um, you know, one of our grandest hopes as for the folks in Peg, uh, Peg Elmer, the folks that kind of conceived of this was that by bringing this group together, we would um, be able to catalyze the energy, the ideas, and begin to move forward um, collectively as a state in the conversation that's being led by our legislature. Thanks to Amy Sheldon um, from Middlebury, who's the chair of the General Assembly Committee that's been charged with kind of getting public input and, and uh, figuring out where, where is Act 250 going to go. Um, but gosh, there's too many people for me to even begin to thank. Uh, Diane Snelling, the chair of the Natural Resources Board. Julie Moore from Natural Resources. Uh, just what an amazing gathering of folks. So thank, thank you for, for coming. Um, some more specific thanks. I want to thank um, Kate McCarthy and Peg Elmer in particular for their, their tremendous work to pull all of this together, to organize the panels, the speakers, the invitations. Um, thanks to VT Digger. Um, and to Teresa Murray Clausen, um, who have helped promote and advertise and who will be providing um, coverage and uh, 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 information about this out to the public as this goes forward. Um, thanks to the Vermont Planners Association, thanks to the Vermont Natural Resources Council, um, to the High Meadows Fund, to Two Rivers out of Queechee, and to the Vermont Association of, of um, Planning and Development, did I, BAFTA. I never have to say it out loud, so Vermont Association of Planners and Developers, Development Agencies, there we go. I knew, it's not developers, sorry. Could never confuse regional planning commissions with developers. Um, so thank you to all of you who, who pulled together to, to pull this off. Um, I also wanted to note a couple of logistics. One, the bathroom situation here is a little odd. Um, <coughs> And I don't mean the, the composting toilets thing. I mean just that for a group this, this large, um, at breaks, um, giving coffee and tea and all of that, there would be more of you than could fit in the, the little bathrooms just up the hallway. So there are also bathrooms on the second and third floor of that, the Deba Boys building. There's also bathrooms around the corner. If you go across through this door out into our little um, cafe and around the corner, there's some bathrooms there. There's some bathrooms in the library. Um, and there's some bathrooms all the way down the hall into the Oaks classroom building. So uh, I suspect just given the mass of people, you may have to use all of those um, options. <laughs> um, another logistical thing, we, have a, we, we now operate year round as a law school and we have an entering group of, of uh, law students, uh, about 25 or so, who are on campus today and will be participating in a whole series of orientation meetings that will be in meeting rooms scattered about and there's some breakout sessions this afternoon and if you find yourself in a room where you're being informed about um, how to prepare for a case or learning about the Socratic method um, of instruction, you're probably not in the right room. So just a heads up around that. Um, oh, and then continuing legal education credits. For those of you who are impaired by a Juris Doctor degree and are looking for um, continuing legal education credits, there's a sign-up sheet out in, in the um, foyer here, and make sure that you fill out the uh, evaluation form and you can get a certificate of participation. So with that, um, let me turn things over to um, Amy Sheldon, who will, will kick things off and kind of get us oriented, and um, I'll follow on with a little more discussion about the challenges we're facing. But again, thank, welcome, and thank you so much. Thank you, David. Um, wow, thank you all for being here. I, I got to say, last week when 
set, we thought the session was over and we thought we were gonna get into our Act 250 work. There was a moment when I felt really alone and um, no, that's just, uh, you disabused me of that completely. It's great to see you all here. It's my absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, what I'm gonna just briefly cover is the legislative process we're in, um, and then I get to talk first and step back and listen and learn from all of you today. So thanks again um, for taking the time to participate. It does mean a lot to us. Just a little bit about me um, and my interest in land use planning. I am a natural resource planner professionally, um, but my first job was at the Middlebury Land Trust, and um, Art Gibb was actually on our board. So um, he was the chair of the first Act 250 Commission and certainly piqued my interest in serving in the legislature, and I thought one day I'll do that. Um, I didn't know that the, the stars would align for me to actually get to follow in his footsteps. And I know we all love where we live in Vermont, but I would make the case that Addison County can be a really good sampler of all of the issues facing Vermont. And so um, I'm proud to chair it and, and put my time and effort into it. Um, Act 47 is the, st is the law that we're operating under and it created a commission on Act 250 the next 50 years. Um, we have six legislators who are the commission, but we also have a Cracker Jack crew of advisors, 14 people, five of whom are from the administration or their appointees from the agencies who work most closely with Act 250. And um, then um, the remainder is from sort of all over the spectrum of interested parties, from the development community to the planning um, agencies and everybody in between. I have to lean over so much. Um, so our process began in September, and it's about a year and a half process. We started by hearing from our advisors in public hearings in the State House, one a month, September, October, November, December. And um, then, of course, we started the session. And during the session, we had um, began, we, we did some subcommittee work. Um, one of the great things is that in some ways we don't have enough time to get our hands around all the issues, but there are so many people excited and interested. The, the biggest challenge is going to be how to get the public input and the input from professionals who use Act 250 from all the various ways and angles we do it. And not just Act 250, but land use planning in general um, and, and compile that into a meaningful report. So the three phases of our process, the um, background information that's over that ended in December, we're just beginning the public output phase, and that starts on June 27th, we'll have our first public hearing. There'll be six public meetings around the state. Um, but in addition to that, we're going to have online surveys and hard copy surveys available. And most importantly to many of you is that we're gonna ask you to take, we're gonna have a meeting in a box and have you facilitate additional meetings so that we can get to as many Vermonters as possible. And the purpose of those public meetings really is to get high level input from Vermonters themselves on the issues that they see confronting us. We will frame those questions for them and, and get their input, but see if there's anything that we're, we've missed, first of all. Um, educate people on what is land use planning, what is Act 250 and what isn't Act 250. There's a lot of people who get confused. Um, um, and more importantly though, kind of touch in with the public and see what is the appetite for more environmental protection um, and how do they see their communities growing and evolving and staying um, vibrant in the future? And, and is there a role for land use planning and um, regulation in that? What is, and what is their appetite for that? So we'll have many ways, many avenues for the public to engage. And then um, we will move into, in September, we move into um, our report writing phase and then we will, it, m the legislation is a little bit open-ended. Um, it allows us to recommend changes or not recommend changes. Um, actually, one thing, one little point that you are probably all at least individually aware of, but you may not know the cumulative factoid around this, which I find interesting, is that Act 250 is actually the most amended section of statute, at least that's, that's the sort of buzz around the State House building. It's been amended just about every biennium um, since its inception. Um, and if I skipped over this too quickly, it turns 50 in 2018, or 2020, excuse me. And so, you know, it's a really great time to look at what was a, a landmark environmental legislation. It was only ever partially implemented, and so the conversations around um, how do we, do we or do we not um, engage in a more broad scale statewide planning, um, and what are the things we need to talk about 
The subject areas in our statute are very similar to the breakout sessions that will be happening today, looking at fragmentation and settlement patterns, uh, climate change, and can we integrate more um, consideration for impacts of climate change into our land use regulation and, and planning, um, water quality, uh, appeals and structure, just sort of, we're not sure how much of that will take to the public, but I very much appreciate the fact that professional organizations are taking the lead in this kind of conversation. The hope for the public meetings is that they remain very high level and visionary, um, and that we provide avenues for people to give us the feedback on specific changes that need to happen, um, but that the public meetings really focus on, on the higher level conversation of where do we see the state going and what is the role of Act 250 in the future. Um, then the final sections that we dive into more deeply are jurisdiction and exemptions. And I do believe they do parallel the breakouts this afternoon. So it's the intention of, of the sponsors of this conference today, as well as my own commission, to take your input. We're going to get a report summarizing what happens today, and um, I promise you that we'll read it and integrate it into our work into the future. So thank you again for coming out and spending the time and for all of your care and concern for the Vermont landscape. Thank you, Amy. Well, I've, I've been given the task of trying to identify some of the, the challenges facing us as we embark in this effort, um, which I think in, in, in many ways, Amy, uh, Representative Sheldon has just summarized pretty effectively. But I'd, I'd like to give a little kind of more colorful perspective on it. And I'll, I'll note that I am not an expert on Act 250. I don't consider myself to be. I've, I have certainly practiced law in the area, and I've certainly um, interacted with the statute over the years. But I, I feel far from an expert. and I'm trying to, in fact, through my remarks, reflect back some of the commentary I've heard um, over, over a period of years, frankly. Um, and I'll also note that Vermont Law School has, has had a tradition of being engaged in this work that goes back quite a ways, um, all the way to Dick Brooks, uh, Professor Emeritus here at Vermont Law School. And if, if you haven't had the chance to glance through his paper, um, we've made available a, a, a link to his paper online. It's still, it's a work in progress, so it's not quite fully polished. Um, thanks to some of you for offering you know, some editorial remarks to help um, clean it up. But nonetheless, the content of it reflects some really a uh, long-term deep thinking that Professor Brooks has provided after really a career of looking at Act 250. And so it's worth looking at his perspectives on, on where the law has been and where he thinks it, it ought to go. Um, there were also, I'll note, you know, there's one of the, the, the long-term challenges from the very inception of Act 250, um, but all the way through its life, has been the idea of state planning. Um, it was, you know, initially a law that had a very substantial component of state planning that was stripped out early in the early days, and then uh, attempted to be added back. Doug Costell, a former dean at the law school, participating in the, in the Act 200 commission that, you know, presented a whole set of ways to begin to get communities in the state of Vermont to be part of a state planning effort. And that too has been as a result of the multitude of amendments, um, largely been um, removed from the statute. So it remains um, largely a permitting statute. Um, and so I think that I'll just leave with that as a, a theme. I, I think that's a fundamental challenge for us as we look at the statute is the, the degree to which it has simply become a permit-by-permit permit ad hoc decision-making tool. It's not that it's completely divorced from municipal planning or regional planning, but the linkages are not strong. And it's also, uh, we have a plethora of other plans in the state. We have, uh, just within the Agency of Natural Resources, there's a variety of plans, river planning, um, you know, uh, uh, watershed planning. There's all sorts of plans. And then, of course, transportation has, has plans, as does we have plans around housing and other attributes of, uh, that all touch on how we develop on the landscape at the state level. It's, it's not true that we don't have state planning. Uh, it is true that those plans aren't effectively coordinated. Um, it's also true that those plans don't necessarily link up um, and align with the regional plans. Uh, and it also is true that the municipal planning, um, to the extent that it happens, um, lines up with the regional plan. So there's, there's a, a degree to which planning and the, inter and the intersection with Act 250 remains a fundamental challenge. It goes back to the very beginning 
days. Um, and you'll, you'll hear from some other speakers today who will kind of share experiences from other states uh, on, on how they've begun to try to challenge, you know, deal with that challenge in their own states. This is not unique to Vermont. Um, one, one speaker last night who you'll hear from suggested maybe we should just not call it planning. <laughs> maybe the problem is we need a different word. But I'll let, I'll let her um, expound on that idea. But anyway, so I, I see that as a central challenge, is thinking about how do we, if we're going to modify and amend Act 215 to the future, how do we tackle this issue? It's been highly controversial, it's been elusive, um, yet it remains central to um, answering the question of what is this landscape going to look like? But in some ways, maybe I've leaped over maybe the biggest challenge that we should start with, which I know is the, the legislative um, commission is going to be trying to understand and get perspective on from the public, which is, do we have a shared vision of what the landscape in Vermont should look like? Um, and then second, is Act 250 the vehicle that we want to use to try to protect and preserve whatever that shared vision is? So I think there are some very high level discussions that we need to have, but my sense is based on substantial work over the years that's been done, um, including work by the Vermont Council on Rural Development, that there's a fairly strong alignment across ideological perspectives and what we want the landscape to look like. Where it breaks down is, is the role of Act 250 in protecting that and then the balancing between protecting um, private interests and, uh, and the broader public interests that we, we always need to figure out how to balance in these conversations. So with that, with those very large kind of high level um, challenges that we face, some of the, the more specific and in our face challenges are just simply the fact that the, the world has changed since 1970 when the, the act was first enacted. Substantial changes, and it continues to change, and we can see on the horizon some even, even larger changes. Um, one, there's been a, a very pragmatic level here at the law school. We spent a lot of time talking about all the variety of environmental laws that have passed, many of which passed in the 70s and 80s. Um, and have continued in, in through, uh, they stopped at the federal level, but they've continued, at least in Vermont, we have continued to add and adapt environmental laws over the period of time since the law was first enacted. So Act 250 is no longer a central law in terms of the variety of air pollution, water pollution, uh, waste management, um, that it was, may have been intended to address in its early days. And so there's a ch significant challenge to think about how do we, in, how do we uh, intersect those two permitting regimes. That's complicated, wickedly complicated work to do. And the act and the current systems, I don't think are sufficiently um, interactive. Uh, we, we are not, we have very uh, um, inefficient and confusing processes for applicants, for advocates, and for the broader public to try to figure out how these permitting systems and regulatory programs fit together. Another major challenge has been technology. Technology has changed dramatically in lots of different ways and we see bigger changes on the horizon. Whether we're talking about energy systems, solar, uh, wind, other renewables. Um, the wind battles alone, you know, have changed the, the landscape and the way and the relationships among um, all of us who are engaged in thinking about uh, the Vermont landscape. Solar energy having similar impacts. And the relationship between the uh, work of the Public Utility Commission and their work in approving um, uh, energy projects and what happens on land use. Also not, not really baked. We don't really have a good, comfortable, streamlined system for managing the very important choices that we're making about what the landscape looks like in light of the changes in energy technology. So if we are committed as a state to, um, you know, what is it, 90% by 2050, of renewable energy as part of our energy portfolio. What does that mean for our landscape and is there a role for Act 250? Um, should there be a role for Act 250 in that or is it just we're going to ignore that, pretend that there is no man behind the curtain? Um, transportation, transportation technology. What's, you know, what's happening there in terms of an electrified transportation fleet? Um, what does it mean if in fact we begin over the next uh, coming decade to have cars that are self, you know, guiding, what's, what's happening with transportation? That also relates to a set of changes that are happening that are not entirely uh, uh, technology based, but also a cultural element. What's, as, as, as the, the generations of Vermonters are growing up and wanting to live um, in small downtowns and cities and, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, in 
you know, not, not out in the suburban sprawl. If that pressure changes, what does that mean? Because we also know we have a, a, a strong, a, a major problem in terms of affordable housing in our communities. So the, the intersection between energy, transportation, other infrastructure like communications infrastructure and housing and the landscape, right? These are all su substantial changes that have been happening and will continue to happen. Um, is Act 250 in its current frame, you know, s up to the task of adapting to that? Similarly, we have, you know, one of the central pieces of our economy, um, our agricultural economy, our forest economy, our working lands economy, major changes happening there. The dairy industry is under a, a major pressure right now and has been for a period of years, the consolidation of dairies, the, the water quality challenges, just the, the existential challenges facing the dairy sector, um, and a proliferation and hopefully you know, growth in the diversity and different kinds of farming um, as, as it evolves in the state. These are, these are major changes, pressures. What role for Act 250? You know, for value added um, processing of our food products and forest products, how, does that, how do we fit that into um, protecting the landscape as whatever vision we have for that. Similarly, for the forest economy, major disruptions have happened um, over the past decade with, with substantial changes and the, and the way in which land ownership and the demographic changes in the state, the, the, the way in which um, land is being held in increasingly smaller and smaller blocks. The things that we have assumed um, would be the case um, are no longer going to be the case going into the future. And we can either wait until it gets to a crisis moment, or perhaps we can use this moment in time to think about what would we like, how would we like to deal with those challenges, and is Act 250 a vehicle that we could use to do that? And then uh, finally, I'll just mention one of my own personal interests and in a, a pet area that I think is, is substantial but um, important, uh, um, even though it's you know just one of many issues, but is the issue of a polluted stormwater runoff in the state, an area that I've, I've worked on extensively when I was with the Department of Environmental Conservation and the work that continues on. That, that, that is not just a pollution issue, that's about how do we live on the landscape issue. You know, as we begin to look at what are the challenges facing our lakes and ponds and streams and rivers, it turns out not to be just finding a few polluters, it's, that it's all of us, it's all the activities on the landscape. And it's the way in which we manage and live in accordance or in association with our river systems. So in a time as we head into what is probably the biggest and most substantial change that we face of all, which are the impacts of climate change and the, the, the dramatic increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, what does that mean for our landscape? What does it mean for our rivers? What does it mean for um, our forests? What does it mean for our wetlands and floodplains? And I say all of those things because it's not it's not all negative and it's all not all bad news. We have in Vermont a landscape that has the attributes of a state that could be resilient and can also uh, play a major role in moving to a, a, you know, a carbon, at least a carbon neutral kind of future. We have all the attributes that we can figure out how to use our forests, use our healthy soils, figure out how this concept of, of working in um, community centers, towns and village centers um, with a working landscape around us, how that in its own way um, is a major contribution to living in a, you know, a carbon um, free uh, um, kind of future. We have, we have all the tools and um, attributes that we need before us. Can we step up and use this moment and look at Act 250 as a focal point? It may be putting too much on Act 250 to say it's gonna solve all of those multitude of problems. But at its best, Act 250 has been a place that brings community groups together with state officials to figure out how we want the landscape to work. So that's the, I'll conclude there by just saying I think that's my greatest and highest hope is that this process will fully engage the broader Vermont public and that we will come out of this conversation enriched with a, a, a recommitment to a shared set of values. So with that, um, I will turn it over to the next person. Next two people, yes, thank you. I, I think these folks need no introduction, but uh, <laughs> I, I think you all know um, the, our Natural Resources Board Chair, Diane Snelling, um, longtime um, supporter of Act 250 and a, and a major player in the state, so thank you. Thank you, and Rob Wilmington of, tell me your firm's name. Long time. 
<laughs> who is going to have his remarks. Um, I was asked to talk about the history and heroics of Act 250, and it ha uh, so I've taken sort of a personal view towards that, so bear with me. I know there are people in the audience who um, can correct me if I've stated the wrong names or the wrong years. But good morning and welcome. I thank you to the Vermont Planners Association, especially Peg and the steering committee, the Vermont Law School, VNRC, VT Digger, and Representative Amy Sheldon, chair of the Act 47 Legislative Commission on Act 250 the next 50 years. I don't know if there are any other members of the commission, but I welcome them. Um, perhaps Representative Dean was here. No, okay. Um, I've enjoyed the research in preparation for these remarks and strongly recommend that interested people will read some of the published histories of Act 250, including Professor Richard Brooks' treatise and his recent essays, Paul Gillis uh, for many articles, but especially Act 250 from birth to middle age, Greening Vermont by Elizabeth Courtney and Eric Zensi, and The Story of Vermont by Christopher Kleiza and Stephen Trombulak. We recently, the Natural Resources Board recently moved our offices from the Dewey Building at the National Life Campus to number 10 Baldwin Street. And let's see. Uh, and then we had been in that building for quite a while. So of course we found some really interesting artifacts along the way. Um, one of the best examples is a very large binder uh, labeled Art Gibbs Historical Novel about Vermont's Environment. Act 250 history from 1966 to present day, which although not truly a novel, <laughs> does contain the best kind of information that is familiar to most legislators, drafts, reports, correspondence, except there are very few notes and I intend to keep researching to see what I can find. The binder also had the passage of Act 250, 1960 to 1970, written in 1992 by Christopher Bailey for the History Honors Program at Dartmouth College, and I found that very helpful. It was a very, it's a very step-by-step um, -step kind of description of the legislative process. I also watched the wonderful Vermont public television series, The Governors, with Chris Graff interviewing Dean Davis. To start at the beginning, I'm not a native Vermonter, but I am very local, and I've been around for a long time. I'm actually old enough to remember um, the passage of Act 250, and I know there are a few other old coots in the audience, so <laughs> bear with us as we talk about the past. In 1970, I was 18, a senior at CVU High School, and full of fire about re equality and um, honoring the earth. Before that, however, I remember the building of Interstate 89. It was a very exciting time, and it seemed that there was massive earth moving everywhere. We went on frequent family excursions to view the progress from the first boulder, bulldozers to placing the signs. The building of the interstate provided something new and exciting every day. It literally reshaped Vermont. When I see the aerial photos of the half-finished cloverleaf in South Burlington or the original Cupola Hotel, it's difficult not to time travel a bit. I recently became aware of the UVM Landscape Change Program and their amazing collection of digital images of Vermont. I've spent hours visiting the past and I would recommend it's well worth looking up. Uh, you can just go to the UVM Landscape Change Program and easily search and find hundreds of really wonderful photos of Vermont history. And that's the majority of what you're seeing here. <laughs> um, one of the first images I found was the bulldozers breaking ground in a field near South Burlington. It produced an instant memory of the intense curiosity I felt watching it happen. It's well known that the interstate brought um, big changes to Vermont, and many more people could, tr could visit and stay in this beautiful state. New types of commerce emerged, and outside perspectives met up with rural ways. I-89 was and is an incredible feat of design and engineering. I tried but failed to find the names of the designers. But even with today's traffic, uh, it's still a wonderful road to drive on. It's a pleasure. 
when we imagine transportation for the next 50 years, I hope it will be as beautiful as 89. Even without the changes of the interstate, 1960 to 1970 was a dramatic decade. In 1962, Phil Hoff was elected in Vermont as the first Democratic governor in over 100 years, and President Kennedy was assassinated. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act passed, and the Beatles played at Shea Stadium. There were riots in Selma in 1965 and in Detroit in 1967. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in March of 1968, and then Robert Kennedy in June. It was a time of great um, change and turbulence and a growing awareness of the need to engage to be part of making the world a better place. Human impacts on the environment were part of the discussion. Uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, had been published in 1962 and continued to gain momentum. In Vermont, there was a lot of optimism because of Hoff's election. He was a bold thinker and understood the times. He was reelected in 1964 and in 1966. In 1965, the average median income in Vermont was $6,900, and the population was about 390,000 people. When I read that, it was a um, very shocking way to remember how much has changed in terms of the economy also. A piece of personal history, in 1966, my father ran against Governor Hoff in his campaign for a third term. Of course, my father lost. He knew he wouldn't win, but he ran anyway to give the people a choice. Sincerely, it was hard at the time, but it also led to, I hope, great personal growth. The knowledge that it was possible for a candidate of good qualifications and ideas and uh, could, could run and still lose is an excellent preparation for the realities of politics. Dean Davis ran for governor and was elected in November of 1968, defeating Jack Daly, the lieutenant governor and a former mayor of Rutland. In the same election, George Aiken was reelected to the US Senate. Davis had been considered the underdog. He had never run for election and wasn't well known, although he had served as president of the National Life Company for many years. On the Vermont Public Television governor's uh, program, Governor Davis responds to Chris Graff's question, what made the difference in this election? By saying he and his wife went to every town in Vermont twice and some places much more often. He also talks about visiting, quote, centers of influence, which he further describes as important people that could persuade other people. Uh, Governor Davis was well known for being practical. The interstate had brought rapid second home development in southern Vermont, and because there wasn't any regulation, the houses were built on steep slopes with inadequate septic. Bill Schmidt of the Wyndham County Regional Planning Commission invited the governor to come and see what was happening, and he did. The scene as described was awful, with sewage running down the hill. Bill continued to be an activist and an agitator on behalf of finding a solution and protecting the environment. In June of 1969, Governor Davis issued an executive order creating a commission of environmental control to review the situation and deliver a report back to the legislature in January of 1970. Art Gibb, the representative from Weybridge, was appointed chair of the commission, which is, of course, why it's referred to as the Gibb Commission. Art Gibb was a retired investment banker who moved to Vermont in 1951 to farm. He was first elected to the House in 1962 and served on Ways and Means, and when the chair of House Natural Resources became vacant, he asked to be appointed and was. In 1971, Gibb was elected as a senator from Addison County and served until 1987. Even after Hoff's election, the, legislative, uh, the legislature maintained a Republican majority. In 1969, the Speaker of, House, uh, the Speaker of the House was Richard Mallory, who later became a congressman. In 1970, John Burgess became speaker. He later became a lieutenant governor. The Senate pro tem was George Cook in 1969. However, he was appointed by President Nixon to the US attorney position, and Ed Janeway became pro tem. The members of the commission 
constituted a diverse range of expertise. I think we have a list, yes. Unfortunately, there were no women on the commission, so I'm particularly gra uh, glad that Amy is chair of this commission. The task must have seemed overwhelming. We wanted strong controls, Mr. Gibbs said in an interview. The question was how to do it, and I would say we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, there was also an advisory committee um, to the commission, which was a very broad, again, another very broad group of people with lots of expertise who participated very um, uh, closely with the, the commission. And there were three women on this uh, advisory committee. The uh, two women are listed as uh, essentially Mrs. Mrs. Harvey Smith. Um, which to me was a f uh, another throwback to 1969 saying, really? Like, what are their names? I mean, that's not their name. Um, it w and one woman, because she was not married, was listed as Miss. So, I mean, I just, it just was another part of sort of saying, what was the culture of that time? Um, the commission began working during the summer and fall of 1969, and the chair established special committees to report on the issues of water quality, high altitudes, pesticides, open space, and health. As the facts on the special issues are evolved, the, committee wrestle, rest, the commission wrestled with the structure of the necessary controls. Walter Blucher, who was a member of the commission with real planning experience, he drafted an outline which, despite many revisions, remained essentially the same in the final version. In January of 1970, the governor relieved the commission of drafting the report and transferred that responsibility to the attorney general, Jim Jeffords. Jeffords eventually um, enlisted his assistant, John Hansen, to direct the drafting of the report. He was assisted by multiple legislators and citizens, including Jonathan Brownell. The commission report became the basis for H-417 and its process through the legislature encountered many stops and starts. Apparently, there was strong support in the House, especially from many of the legislators who had worked on the passage of the anti-billboard law in 1966. The House Natural Resources Committee and its chair, Mr. Royal Cutts of Townsend, provided strong steady support. There were also many people who were opposed uh, the state ta taking such actions, including Representative Salmon, who later became governor in 1975. Also opposed was Senator Arthur Jones from Essex Orleans, who was chair of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Jones had worked on the anti-billboard law but thought that state control of development was a government intrusion. <coughs> After the usual back and forth, 417 passed both chambers and was signed by Governor Davis on April 9th, 1970. Act 250 is an elegant, did I skip here? In this, I did, in the same spring? In that same spring of 1970, the first Earth Day and the first Green Up Day were celebrated. Governor Davis was reelected in November 1970, again after being considered as an underdog because he had instituted a sales tax and passed Act 250. The politics of then aren't that different from now. Each of the legislators, commission members, advisors, and citizens who participated in creating Act 250 are heroes. Like all significant legislation, the best policy happens when it's possible to collaborate. The legislators of 1969 and 1970 are the same type of individuals who serve today. They care deeply about Vermont and want to find agreements that create solutions. Our world is full of people who seek fame and celebrity. And when I speak of heroes, I am referring to the kind of people who don't think of themselves that way. It's their passion for an issue that makes them heroes. The entire creation of Act 250 was heroic. It remains a vivid example of people thoughtfully doing what they believed with right, was right. Act 250 is an elegant law, and it deserves to be implemented with the same grace as it was written. Its goals remain relevant, although it does need to adapt to new knowledge and science. As you consider the questions posed by Act 47, remember this is an opportunity to create the next phase of a legacy for Vermont. 
Please try not to be distracted by the current flaws in the program and have the vision to imagine an ideal situation. We must think first about what we hope will be the Vermont in the future we want. And then we can decide by determining what we want, we can design the right regulation to deliver those outcomes. In your discussions, please also try to keep separate the law from the administration. I know there are many examples of delays and confusion, and from the beginning of my time as chair, I have been committed to developing a high-functioning permit process. The NRB continues to make improvements to our administrative protocols, and although these changes may not yet be apparent to applicants, progress is happening. In December, we are on schedule to launch a completely online application. It's my hope that soon applicants will have the predictability and consistency that they deserve from the permit process. It's also my hope and intention that planning and regulation must start working together to find the alignment that Vermont needs. As planners, you have the unique role in these discussions because it remains critical that the work of municipalities and regional planning organizations be respected and recognized as an essential part of statewide thinking. I'd like to end with a quote from my father from 1983 when he was governor. The statement is from a publication titled Managing Rural Growth, the Vermont Development Review Process. It was produced by the Environmental Board of the State of Vermont. Our challenge is to preserve those things about Vermont for which we love her, while building economic opportunity so that it is not necessary to be already wealthy to enjoy this unusual place. To meet that challenge, we must begin with a determination to protect our environment. If we fail there, there will be little point to success in economic scene because we would have lost that which we wish to be able to afford. If the prize is gone, the struggle loses meaning. The Vermont environment is that prize. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, David, in his opening remarks, talked about what really is the evergreen issue for discussing um, Act 250, which is what is the role of planning and regulatory review. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that issue played itself out in uh, a series of highly contested uh, regulatory battles in the 1980s involving the Tonington Ski Area. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, what Diane called the culture of those times. Um, in the early 80s, Killington was expanding aggressively with ski infrastructure and with residential real estate development. And each condominium phase and each uh, expansion of the, of a ski lift was being treated uh, by Killington as the applicant as a freestanding project unrelated to anything else they were doing. Uh, in the real estate uh, development, there were often different entities developing it, but they were all part of the same resort. They were all sharing common infrastructure and highways and sewage. Uh, and the cumulative impacts of these developments were just not being looked at at all. Um, the, um, the issue really was, uh, I think, framed well by Monty Fisher, who was the, C the executive officer, director of Vermont Natural Resources at that time. And on the page one story in the New York Times in November of 1985, he said, quote, the law doesn't deal with the cumulative impact of a place like Killington. Killington is on a scale we've never seen before and it's stretching the human and natural resources uh, to their limits. So VNRC decided to jump into that fight. They hired Beth Humstone over there as their uh, expert planner, and they started petitioning for party status in virtually every Killington-related project. And Killington at that time was represented by the uh, same law firm that defended tort suits against the resort, and that firm brought a very highly litigious style um, to Act 250 proceedings before a local commission that really tried the patience and the capacity of the, uh, the volunteers who served in that commission. Uh, my colleague Harvey Carter and I represented VNRC in these actions, as well as in some cases the Connecticut River Watershed Council was involved, the town of Shrewsbury, uh, other attorneys involved were Mark DeStefano, Jim Dumont, 
Mark Sinclair and Bill Roper. Um, this battle over controlling the growth of Killington was largely, but not entirely, played out in Act 250. Uh, and the key precedent at the time these, this, this litigation started was a board decision in 1984 called In Re Bruce Levinsky. And that had been an application for construction of the second phase of a private sewer line that was intended to serve a subdivision. But the application only described you know, the pipe and what the excavation was gonna be like. Uh, it didn't talk at all about the potential impacts that would be made possible by creating that infrastructure. Uh, and the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission and uh, two state agencies uh, took the position that that application was incomplete without any assessment of the impacts of the development that would be made possible by the construction of the sewage capacity. And the Environmental Board agreed and held that the sewer line and the proposed subdivision were a single project and the application must uh, describe details of the entire project, not just the mere construction of the sewer line. Uh, and so at Killington, that was the precedent that uh, the challengers to the resort wanted to apply to a, a, a ski area that was developing in many different ways. Uh, and um, there was sustained and uh, fervent opposition from the resort. And this produced uh, highly contested hearings before the district commission. Uh, and it was spilled over into statewide politics uh, with the ski area attacking the state of Vermont, its agencies, and its then new governor, Madeline Kunin. And finally, the focus of a number of, of uh, there were a number of cases, but the one that really became the one that got most public attention and the focus of uh, the most, uh, I think, hotly debated hearings uh, involved a proposal by Killington to construct a pond for snowmaking in an undeveloped portion of the town of Menden called Parker's Gore. Uh, and Killington took the position that this was an application to build a pond, but let's get going. Uh, and didn't want to talk at all about considering the scope of the development that would be made possible by this new snowmaking infrastructure. Um, and uh, there was seemingly endless procedural wrangling about whether this was a simple pond in the woods or the first step in a big development. Um, but it soon became clear that there was actually an overriding issue uh, related to this project, which was wildlife habitat, um, the reliance of black bears on the, the wetland that was at the site of the proposed uh, pond site. Um, and as with, as the lawyers in the room know, and most of the planners know, in these cases, you end up with expert witnesses. Uh, and Killington hired a bear expert from Montana. And the state of Vermont was actively involved. The Department of Fish and Wildlife had some of its good biologists there and also hired um, outside experts from Maine and Tennessee. Uh, and um, these experts, on one side and the other could not agree on anything. Uh, the state and the uh, outside experts said this was an exceptionally rich bear habitat, it's very, very important. Uh, construction of the pond would destroy the habitat, the bears would be imperiled. Uh, and the guy from Montana said, no, 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 not true, no bears, no, no problem. Um, and so you could see the frustration, and this was before the environmental board, of getting this testimony that just didn't uh, mesh at all. So. On the third day of the hearings, as I remember it, um, Killington issued a challenge. They said, let's go out and look at the area. And the rest of us couldn't believe this guy was such a good idea that we never thought it would have come from them. But, but the, problem, the problem was that you had all these uh, environmental board members dressed up for a hearing, uh, you know, ready, ready to hear testimony. And uh, the issue was, would they be willing to go for a hike in the woods? And it, pretty quickly became clear that, that they needed to get everybody along and that was gonna depend on Art Gibb, who Diane mentioned, who was I, probably about 80 at that point. And so everybody looked at Art and Art said, you know, I've got boots in my car, let's go. <laughs> um, and he went out to his car, got his boots, and we went tramping off into the woods. Um, and we got to the site and the bear experts were about to start you know, talking and pointing things out to the commission when Art said, you know, I, I think I found some evidence. And we all looked at him and he was looking down in his boots and sure enough, he had stepped in some very persuasive and clear evidence that bears were using that, <laughs> were, were, were using that habitat. Uh, and then went downhill for Killington the rest of the day because there was evidence everywhere of this. And, uh, and, and luckily Yvonne Daly from the Rutland Herald was there and she wrote a story about it the next day, appeared in page one of the Rutland Herald. So pretty soon this, the whole state knew about it. 
Uh, and that, that really solved the factual issues. And once those were solved, it was pretty clear, I thought, where the case was going to go. But it took two years and a Supreme Court decision uh, to get it there. Uh, and ultimately, uh, Parker Square is now a conserved area. Um, the, the pond was never built. Um, Killington was able to get the snowmaking infrastructure he wanted by going to Woodard Reservoir in Plymouth, working with the dam owner there, who I ended up representing. And we worked out, uh, with the help of the state, an arrangement where they have a, a source of water that doesn't involve uh, constructing in, in uh, Parker Square. A number of these cases ended up at the e-board, and it did apply the Levinsky principle. Uh, the board held in one case that, where, oh, I'm going to read this, where there exists a growth facility, clear evidence of a plan for growth beyond what was presented in the application, and a direct relationship between growth and the proposed construction, an application may be deemed incomplete until additional information about the overall master development plan is submitted for commission review. Uh, and the commission can then convene a hearing on the merits to decide the scope of the project, and the commission may obtain more information in order to adequately evaluate the project. So you can talk later today about whether master planning is being effectively uh, applied, and there's still arguments about what the scope of a project is, and particularly what information is relevant. Uh, and I was at Killington with, uh, with some people here in this room three years ago, and we had a long, long proceeding along for a week about what the scope of the traffic study should be in connection with a new phase. So these, uh, these issues always get played out in the facts of the case. Uh, but uh, Killington uh, and other skiers, I think, are doing a much better job uh, of, of looking at the, at the big picture. And it certainly helps the developers to get decisions on uh, uh, compliance with some of the criteria in advance so they know that they have more than one phase or meet, the, uh, or meet the standards. Uh, Act 250 was not the only arena where these issues played out. The Water Resources Board, now gone, uh, decided a major case uh, involving septic disposal and the impact of water uh, in these high altitude uh, uh, developments. And uh, it was a case called, uh, involved the Sunrise Development, which is also at Killington. They built a large treatment plant. They got a uh, permit from the agency, uh, and um, we, we were, my partner Harvey Carter and I took an appeal to the Water Resources Board and the question was whether um, water that came through a spray field and then discharged into the surface water, even if it was chemically and biologically uh, clean, uh, required a, an MPDS discharge permit uh, and, and could it get one. Uh, and uh, there was a case that was decided by an evidentiary objection. We objected to uh, expert talking about the quality of the water because we said it wasn't, re wasn't relevant, it was waste, uh, and it needed a permit. Uh, they sustained the objection, and uh, all of a sudden, a, uh, a fully developed treatment plant wasn't going to be usable. Uh, and that, um, that got the attention of a lot of people. Uh, it was in the front page of the New York Times. Uh, I went back and found the article. It's interesting. It says, the ruling effectively halts expansion at most of Vermont's other ski areas brought to a climax a long dispute over whether the resort's growth in recent years benefits the state's economy or threatens its main attraction, the Green Mountains. And uh, the result of that was the legislature came, dealt with it effectively and swiftly by enacting rules for indirect discharge permits and, and bringing clarity to, what the, uh, to how in-ground uh, uh, large septic systems should be developed, particularly in high mountain areas. Uh, and they got, eventually got to use their septic system, but the development community and people concerned about growth ha had clear rules. But they only came out, in this case isn't so many others, because of litigation that forced issues to be heard. Um, the New York Times was not the only, um, the only publication covering all this. Ski Magazine got involved, and um, they declared that Vermont was, quote, in a state of civil war between Governor Cunin and the resort owners. Um, and I'm going to read a short quote from the ski, the ski article I'm talking about, and uh, please feel free to hiss after I read it. Um, <laughs> it said, quote, Governor Cunin, a Democrat, immigrant, female, Jewish, was elected to, in 1984, the state historically and overwhelmingly fond of none of the above. You can believe that. But you get the flavor. It was, thank you for hissing. It was, it was, it, there were some really ugly dimensions to this. 
And the district commission, district commission number one, who had to hear all these hearings, was really in a tough position. They were in a highly charged political atmosphere that was getting statewide and, and broader attention, and they were just trying to figure out what Act 250 meant and how to apply it. Uh, so finally, I just, for, at least for some of the lawyers here, I just want to go over, talk about some of the other sort of collateral ways that these types of, of disputes played out in the press and the public arena. Uh, Killington sued BNRC to subpoena its membership list and governance information in an attempt to, to deny it uh, party status. Uh, result, subpoena quashed, didn't go forward. Uh, Killington filed a petition in Superior Court for an extraordinary writ to seek to force the District Commission to proceed on an application in the narrow form filed by Killington rather than asking broader questions. Result, writ denied. Um, uh, a sideshow in this whole thing was Killington's proposal to make snow from treated effluent. Uh, this did not play well in the, rel in the realm of public relations. Um, the Times Argus published a cartoon showing two Killington skiers carrying toilet plungers. Uh, <laughs> and the caption read, uh-oh, looks like those snowmaking machines are clogged again. Uh, Killington did not think this was funny. They sued the Times Argus for defamation. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall the outcome. I wasn't involved in that, but I don't think they collected. Um, and then someone created a bumper sticker that read, quote, Killington, where the affluent meet the effluent. <laughs> and um, shortly after that was available, a, a carpenter at one of the condos at Killington slapped it on his truck, showed up for work, and his boss saw the sticker and fired him. Like, okay, you're, you're out of here. Uh, his name was Cowboy Snodgrass. Uh, he uh, went to the ACLU Vermont. The ACLU Vermont called a cooperating attorney who was my partner, Steve Saltonstall. Some of you may remember Steve, uh, and Steve um, brought an action, uh, and that ended up in the New York Times also, and Steve, ever quotable, said, quote, it seems to me as if an employee can, cannot speak his mind on political issues, then they become like serfs in the Middle Ages, unquote. Uh, the result of that was Cowboy <laughs> Collective. So that's a quick glance back at a time when Act 250 took center stage in a highly politicized public debate about growth uh, and the issues that... Um, were debated and seem somewhat familiar in different contexts today. Thank you. Are you here to address it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so we now have time for a, a, a ten-minute break, um, and then we'll we'll uh, reconvene. I uh, knowing that this group is such a. a um, misbehaviors. Um, maybe I'll say you've got a five minute break and then five minutes to transition back to your seats. So run and find the toilets and then come back. <laughs> 